and welcome to The Porch with Alicia Barlow. Hi, I'm Alicia Barlow, author of The Porch, a place for enjoyment, conversation with people, reflection, and encouragement. Hello, welcome back to The Porch. Today I have Maurice Johnson. Maurice is a husband, a father, a grandfather, a jazz musician, owner and founder of Self Publish Me, author of many books, with a, with a new release, um, Dragonfly Summers. Yes. Today I want to just talk to Maurice and find out about Maurice Johnson. I know that your new book kind of encompasses everything that I just mentioned about you, but I'd like for you to kind of expound on who you are, how did you become, or why did you become a jazz musician, and what drew you to becoming an author and then assisting other people with publishing their books. For one, you assisted me with publishing mine, and I appreciate that. And so tell me, tell us. Wow, that's a loaded question. First, I want to say it's good to be here, and thank you for inviting me as a guest. Thank um, you for being honored here. Honored to be one of your first guests. Uh, that particular question, let's see if I can condense this down into uh, – in, in, into the size of the show that can accommodate the show. So the first question is what uh, inspired me to become a jazz guitarist? Is that well, kind of tell us about some personal information. Okay. You're, I mean, your your husband, your wife is out there. Rita, yes. I think that you just had a anniversary not too long ago. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yes, we had an anniversary in May, our 43rd anniversary. 43 years. As my mind goes blank on the exact date, I think it was a... May 19th. Oh, you better say it right. <laughs> 1819. I think it's the 19th. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Years. I'm always glad to hear or meet someone that, that has, um, you know, a marriage of longevity. Yes. You know. It's, it's it, been, uh, yeah. It's been great. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's good. So many of us are striving for yes. that. <laughs> that is correct. Yes. We have two children. Our oldest daughter is 40. Our, our youngest is uh, 30, I believe. And uh, they're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing good. They're good kids. And we have two grandbabies. Our uh, oldest grandchild is 12, and our, our youngest is getting ready to turn four, August oh, 22nd. You have a young one. Yes. Young one. So, um, as I said, you're, you're a husband, father, and, you know, grandfather, and so coming up, what what did you do? What what inspired you to become one, a jazz a jazz musician? Was that the first your first inspiration? Well, uh, I'd have to say my first inspiration was art, you know. Okay. You know, even music is still a part of the arts, but art in general as I was coming up in school, junior high school, even before then, I was always drawing something. But around 1971, uh, uh my uncle Leon, who was a garbage collector, he brought home a uh, he uh, on, he he brought home uh, some of his collections. Uh, every so often, he'd find some, I guess, some junk or something, and he'd bring it home. And and among it, one one day he came through the den, and he had a, a arm full of stuff and laid it on the couch. And among that was a plastic toy electric guitar. Well, I'm sorry, a plastic toy guitar. It wasn't electric. As a matter of fact, it only had like three strings. I wasn't familiar with the guitar, but I was fascinated by it. So I picked it up and kind of plunked around on it and. That was my first spark, and that that initiated an initial spark for me, and I would play around with that little thing <clears throat> every every other day or so, and and then a few months later, my brother came home, came from uh, back from Vietnam, and um, lo and behold, he had an electric guitar with him, hmm. and I was just as fascinated. So he saw that fascination, and he made a way. F he bought me my first guitar, and uh, paid for my first uh, couple of months of lessons. And that's how it all started. That's, wow. Uh, as far as jazz is concerned, we go forward, you know, after me experimenting a few years with that, go forward about uh, to about five years. Uh, prior to that, I'd just been experimenting with anything that I could learn. And then one day I heard something on the radio. I heard this guy playing guitar and singing the same notes. I was fascinated. I didn't know who that was, but the instant I heard that, I said, that's how I want to play. Wow. So I remember uh, going to the record store. Back then we had our record stores. We'd buy albums and things and, and explained it to the guy. He said, oh, that was George Benson. Oh, it was the Breezing okay. album. So I bought it and, and uh, brought it home and and uh, listened to it. 
And and I actually put my guitar in my closet for about two weeks because I knew if I were going to come anywhere close to that, it had to be a systematic approach. So I just made myself listen, listen to this man play. And so he had to be approaching it different ways. So I taught myself formal fingering, certain aspects of scales, and just really became a student of the instrument, I basically on my own, sitting on my Aunt Juanita's porch. And many years later, in my professional uh, uh, endeavors as a guitarist, I finally met George Benson. We our band opened okay. for him, and I remember telling remember telling him that same story. But wow. that was that was true, true story. Wow, wow. So um, now you did this professionally. Now mm-hmm. were you in a group or did you just single a single uh, um, jazz guitarist? In 1985, I started a band called After Five Jazz. We were initially a trio. Okay. And uh, we gained a lot of popularity, and, and uh, around 1992, we released an, uh, an album, uh, Expressions. And we were fortunate enough to re- perform with many uh, major artists, Once, like I said, George Benson, Nancy Wilson, Al Green, Layla Hathaway. Oh, so this, was, this is big time. Oh, yes. Yeah. We ended up with a record label out of New York called Warlock Records. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, we met many people, Freddie Jackson, uh, all kinds of people that we performed with. Okay. Quite fascinating. Wow. So, um, I know that you do have, um, do you have some new releases for your, your music? Well, the band came to a demise back in 93, shortly after the George Benson concert. But since then, during that, uh, during the, the, um, the demise of After Five, I started engaging in many other endeavors. And along with that, in the early 2000s, well, I'll say around, I'm sorry, 2009, I released my first independent CD on my own called Tonight. And in 19, I'm sorry, not 19, but in 2014, I released uh, uh, Peace, Love, and Jazz. That was my second independent release. And I promoted myself as uh, Maurice Johnson, an American jazz artist. Okay. Wow. Wow, very interesting, very interesting. So what took you from being a jazz musician to, I guess, what came first, authorship or open, or developing um, the self-publishing me company? Well, self-publishing, self-publishing me were many years later, but uh, the first version of me, if, you, if, if, if I can coin that phrase, uh, I was a jazz guitarist. So when the when the band came to de- a demise, I was engaged in many things. And even before, briefly before we, we ended, uh, my first uh, version of publishing was happening around uh, 1987. We were very popular then, and I was always ambitious doing something. And I had this idea. Well, I didn't have the idea in the beginning. But a lot of people would come up to me and ask me uh, questions about business, business aspects of music. Mm-hmm. So a lot of... Uh, uh, aspiring musicians and, you know, fledgling musicians, have you. They'd ask me things about, because we were relatively successful uh, working with major acts and doing a lot of different things. So they kind of looked up to us or me or whoever, and they asked me these questions. So, so they'd ask questions like, well, how much should I charge for a gig? Or should I use the contract? This and that. And uh, I was kind of touched by that, you know. And I always, uh, I've always, we've always heard the adage, musicians make poor business practitioners. And I kind of resented that for a long time because I took the music uh, business very serious because I ran the band. I started the band, and I handled all the business. I did the taxes. I did the booking. I did all that stuff. And it was quite a responsibility, quite a load, and it indeed was a real job. So when somebody asked, do you have a real job, it was quite insulting to hear that. But uh, anyway, uh, I had the idea of the, the most important thing for musicians or anybody for that matter is time and money. So I had an idea to make a, a, a utility or a planner, so to speak, which I called Gigs Monthly Planner for the Professional Musician. And inside was a 12-month calendar. On the back of it, in the back page, was a contract, a, an entertainment contract. So f- there is where musicians or bands uh, that were performing could write down their gig dates, and they'd have a contract that they could use and make a copy of it. Back then, you know, we'd make copies and stuff like that and use that as a template to have a contract or some kind of idea of business instead of just on a paper napkin or just word of mouth. Okay. So that's where that started. So that was my first endeavor uh, around 1987. And I was fortunate enough to get those in a local music store called Driver Music. And subsequently, uh, a jobber saw that who distributed 
my books throughout uh, the very four surrounding state, bordering states. And uh, he bought around like six dozen. And about a week later on a Sunday morning, he called me, he says, I need six more dozen. I said, wow. oh, man. Wow. So I gave him another six dozen, and, and I felt I had something. And that lasted a little while, and it was very good. So that fortified my efforts, and that's how it all began. Now, was that here in Oklahoma? Yes, that was in Oklahoma City. Okay, that, okay. That happened in Oklahoma City. All, you know, all the while, I'm still working with the band. And uh, as the years progressed, you know, I'd engaged in other endeavors, um, and eventually, uh, it's a, it was a long time span between then and self-published me. Okay. Many years after that, you know, almost 30 years oh. difference. So there's a oh, lot okay. that okay. occurred between that. I'll, but I'll, uh, I'll yeah, we'll yeah. talk. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. So um, you said there was a long time span between that and, but you've written other books. Yes, I have. Between um, this, this new one that you have. That is correct. And... Um, the, the journal or the calendar mm -hmm. that, that you, planner. the planner, I'm sorry, yeah. that, that you just described. So let's talk about, I know that your new book, um, Dragonfly yeah. Summers, mm -hmm. probably encompasses a lot of things that you've done in the past and some historical um, things of Oklahoma, um, Enid in particular. Was it Enid? Uh, um El Reno. El Reno. <laughs> El Reno. I knew there was an E. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. So um, kind of tell us, okay, kind of talk about your new book and um, how you've encompassed things about Maurice Johnson in your book and what it's about. Well, um, uh, Dragonfly Summers, A Dream Before Tomorrow, is, is, is based on an autobiography, my personal autobiography, as told through the eyes of young Timmy Johnson. Timmy Johnson was me. When I was growing up, they called me Timmy. Oh. As a matter of fact, uh, before we moved to Oklahoma, I was I came to Oklahoma in 1964, or we came to Oklahoma in 1964 after the death of my mother. So we 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 were born in Milwaukee, and she died in the summer of '64. And um, so, but they called me Timmy after the popular television show back in the day, Lassie. The little main character was Timmy, and um, but the Dragonfly Summers is basically about my young life growing up and coming of age. So it's not about Maurice Johnson, the adult. It's really my years, between the years, my birth, 1959, up until around 1978 when I left my Aunt Juanita's house. And after that, life began. So I don't really tell those stories, but leading up to that, uh, my childhood experiences. So I believe everybody has Dragonfly Summers in the in a childhood dragonfly summers that they can relate to as I convey particular stories in this book. You know, I talk about uh, my grandmother's next door neighbor who was a blind woman. Her name was Miss Nelson. And as a young kid, I was five, six years old. I would spend time with Miss Nelson, helping her gather chickens and sitting on her porch, asking her all kinds of questions. When we first came to Oklahoma in El Reno, uh, I always say this in a conversation. I say we went from indoor toilets and, and uh, paved streets, paved roads to, Dirt roads and outhouses in Oklahoma. So oh. that was quite a contrast. And oh. it was almost like literally going back in time. It, oh, it really okay. was. It was like uh, being uh, pushed back to the beginning at the starting line in life again. Hmm. So it was certainly a, it was quite a culture shock, so to speak. Me being so young, it was easy for me to, to graduate to that. But it's, it's still looking down at it, looking back at it as an adult with my adult eyes, it was really something to experience. Yeah. yeah. So you said that your aunt was here in Oklahoma, but your your family originated in Milwaukee. Yes, I was. We were once again. We were born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, my mother died in 1964. Um, because of that, we came to Oklahoma. When we came to Oklahoma, we uh, our grandmother first took care of us. Netta Overstreet was her name. She was 69 years old at the time. Uh, quite quite old to you know to take on. Uh, the responsibility of six children. So when we came to Oklahoma, we were with her for about at least the first three years, from okay. sixty from sixty four to sixty seven, and then uh, by virtue of uh, the powers that be, uh, we were all separated by twos. And okay. subsequently, my my sister and I, Mary, we ended up with our aunt, our aunt and uncle. So that was Juanita and Juanita Davis and and Leon Davis, and Juanita and Uncle Leon. So we lived with them and. You know, then, you know, life, 
began in a different realm. Okay. Uh, so that's basically how our beginning was. In okay. El, this was throughout El Reno, growing up in El Reno, okay. Oklahoma. Okay. So how did you come up with the title of Dragonfly Summers? I like that title. What, what, when well, you were sitting and writing, what, what said, okay, Dragonfly Summers, what, what okay. prompted you in that? Well, Dragonfly, the, the Dragonfly aspect of it, to me, Dragonfly or Dragonfly Summer implies innocence to me. Okay. I, I don't know what it truly implies, but in my mind, as a Dragonfly Summer, we're young kids, we're seeing well, let's say dragonflies and this and that, you know, we, we appreciate nature. We see the, uh, the, the lightning bugs and all that kind of stuff. We're down here on the ground, you know, they're, you know, the adults are moving around doing what they do, go to their job and everything, but we see life on a different scale and we just see the innocence of life. So that's where the dragonfly aspect of it comes. The subtitle being a dream before tomorrow, it basically implies, um, as a child, as a young child, we have our childhood dreams. We can fly, we can do all this, and we can do all that. And, and one of my last childhood dreams before I was awakened to be, uh, so it's brought to my attention, wake up, Timmy, mama's in the hospital. Mm. So that, to me, was symbolic of being my last official childhood dream, <clears throat> a dream before tomorrow, because tomorrow everything would change. Mm. Wow, wow, okay. Interesting, interesting. I know that when you were introducing your book, um, you put on the on Facebook the colors of that you wanted people to kind of you know give you input. Do you ask for a lot of input on other things when you're for when you're writing or when you're um, playing your music or writing your music? Do you involve your your audience um, in other ways? Uh, from the aspect of making uh, executive decisions, I actually, no. <laughs> this, this one was a little different. I did want to get them involved, and at the same time, I wanted to uh, to share a, a bit uh, bits and pieces of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I wanted to get them actively engaged. As far as music, if I'm producing music, some, something like that. Well, usually in, in my immediate surroundings, my family, my wife, whatever, you know, she'll listen to things, and I'll listen to. Uh, various critiques and things like that, but ultimately I have to make that decision. But I do uh, like to allow fans or followers, if you will, uh, to participate to a degree. And uh, that's why I just kind of fed them a little bit and, and gave them the opportunity to, to choose, help me choose uh, what color for the for the back and things. I had already constituted the, 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 the front, front oh. cover, but I was still scratching my head for the back. Well, I think you made a great decision. Well, I will have to say they made a great decision. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, you, you, it, it was ultimately your yeah. your decision, and I think it was it turned out to be beautiful. It's a beautiful book. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you've written this book, and let's go back. What? How did you start self-publish me? What okay. prompted you into doing that to um, okay. developing that, that um, format or that that company that you have? Okay. Well, in order to answer that question, I'll go back another 25 years or so. Okay. <laughs> and kind of back to the area where we released the, uh, where I released my first uh, version of the Geeks Monthly Planner for the Professional Musician. I kind of took a lack into that. I, I was always, I always liked marketing. I've always been adventuresome and a bit of a risk taker. I wasn't your typical thinker. And so, you know, my, a lot of my, my, let's say band members, co-band members, they had day jobs and things like that. Well, I didn't. I, I was a thinker, always, you know, working my way through some things. So um, I'd find myself thinking up ideas. But the most important thing as far as thinking of ideas, whether it's a book or whatever it is, is acting upon it. If you believe in it, just act upon it. So I was one of those uh, individuals by hook or crook. If it's something I believed in, I was going to make it happen in some capacity or another. So... Uh, after that particular book, I ended up doing something, creating something called Pocket Watch. And, and what it was, it was a little personal incident report journal. And okay. sounds kinda, it was kind of strange, but uh, a lot of people who end up, uh, let's say, they get rear-ended or a little accident, you know, a local uh, type accident uh, and a uh, small accident, nothing major. Mm -hmm. But it's just something for them to document 
uh, let's say you take that individual's uh, insurance information, their name, uh, the patrol officer, things like that. And I designed it about the size of a checkbook register. And matter of fact, it was able to slip in a checkbook register. Okay. So that was one of my second endeavors. But, you know, time went on. It wasn't the most popular, but time went on a few years past. And I think around uh, 90, 96, maybe. Uh, I still, I always thought that the, my initial planner had some, I had, had, uh, some good possibilities beyond what I could do with it. So I pitched the idea to uh, an actual publisher, a major publisher of the day. If you're a musician, you would know the publisher, the name Mel Bay, Mel Bay Publishing. Every, every musician, uh, at least my age, maybe older, would know Mel Bay. So he, uh, Mel Bay produced all kinds of instruction manuals for guitar, flute, drums, any instrument, you name it singing, anything that had to do with the music. So I proposed the idea of, uh, of uh, the Gates Monthly Planner under a new name and the concept, of, of, of course, and I sent it to him. And about three weeks later, I received a, uh, a letter, and he said, we'd love, to, we'd love to publish your plan. I said, wow, I was just excited, yeah. you know. I think it was 93, 96, something like that, a long time ago. But anyway, that was my first uh, my first. Uh, Involvement with an actual publisher, a legitimate publisher, because okay. I used to buy Mel Bay books when I was learning guitar in the early, early days. That's how I learned uh, orchestral chords and things okay. like that. Uh, so, the, and the great thing about it, not only did they publish it, but they said, we would like to introduce it at th- this year's NAM show. NAM stands for National Association of Music Merchants. That's a big major trade show that happens in uh, Anaheim, California in the, in the, in the, um, so in the winter in January and, and uh, Nashville in the summer, and I believe Frankfurt, Germany in another part of the year. But this one was uh, introduced in, in, in Anaheim. So anything music, uh, musical instruments, books, or you have it, they, they, they are introduced at this trade show. Okay. So not only did I they, they, they end up publishing my book, it was just a few short months later, I'd say within the scope of four months, you know, from, from signing the contract to here's my book, on the shelves and, and being displayed at the NAM show. Wow. So, that, you know, it, it wasn't the most, the, the, the greatest financial endeavor, but it was still, it was, it, it fortified my, my efforts and, and, and uh, self-belief okay. and things. So, and uh, shortly thereafter, you know, I started getting reviews and things like that. And I, I told myself, I said, man, I, it, it, because in, in that book, I added about four or five pages and it's something called straight talk. And that's where I shared Information. I just, by my own authority, I started, you know, making suggestions to musicians because I felt like a bit of an author. So, <laughs> so we did that. And uh, but after, you know, after seeing that, I, I told myself, I, I said, I want to write a real book because, you know, this was basically a planner with four pages of text. I want to write something for real. So I began to writing, started writing everything that I knew about music. You know, okay. th- that I'd learned thus far as running the band and things like that, working with, working with the public, working with clients. You know different things, and I put it in a book. And I pitched that around to various actual publishers. I'm going shopping for, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm shopping for publishers. And lo and behold, I got the attention of a few. Okay. And um, from that book, I ended up, uh, I did a chapter on, uh, I wrote a chapter on pricing. And uh, I ended up having a, that, uh, having that chapter featured as an article in a, a, a magazine called Musician Magazine. It was a major magazine of the day, published by Billboard. By Billboard. Okay. And uh, so I had a feature article, and they paid me some good money to do that. And that book hadn't even been publishing it, published yet. And lo and behold, I ended up with another publisher, uh, with a second publisher, Mix Books, who published my book, Build and Manage Your Music Career, 1996. Okay. And uh, that came out, did real well. They got, got an advanced royalty and everything, and sold several books, and and um, about two years later, the catalog was bought by another company called Artist Pro Press. And lo and behold, there was a, a second edition of my uh, of my book under that imprint. So what's been what was happening from uh, ninety three on up, or eighty eighty seven? I was building momentum, as in if you want to call it author slash entrepreneur, just adventuresome person. And it was really uh, once again, it was really pumping me up, so to speak, but it was really encouraging me a lot. I'm seeing all these things happen uh, with the books. And um, 
looking back on one of my, uh, there was a, view, a review online, someone reviewed one of my earlier books, my first book, uh, The Planner, which was called The the New Working Musicians and One Year Organizer. It, was the, where it used to be Geek's Monthly Planner. And he said, this would be a great idea for a software program. And immediately the, the, the light bulb went out in my head and went up in my head. I said, a software program to do this. So, so what did I do? I started searching for uh, programmers. I started writing a feature set, and, and uh, lo and behold, I was able to produce a, um, a software program. It became quite popular called Gigorama, Gig, uh, Gigorama Business Management Software for Musicians. I wanted to be that guy that uh, provided musicians with tools to make them feel that they were really uh, business persons, okay. you know, because I was truly insulted by the statement, do you have a real job? Uh, musicians make poor business practitioners. No. So here I am providing books, providing software. The software did very well. And I ended up writing another subse- subsequent book called Gigarama. Uh, did a deal with uh, one of my publishers. And I did a licensing deal as well as in, in conjunction with a two-book deal. So I wrote the instruction manual to... Gigarama. I sat. I had to sit with a. Uh, I knew every aspect of it, but I had to sit down and definitively write all the instructions. I had two computers and I had the software running on one. And I'm going through every feature and you know breaking it down, screenshots and everything. And um, so we did. That's when they had things on CDs back then. So it was a book with a CD in the back, and that book sold for like fifty nine dollars. Okay. So they'd have a CD in the back. They'd have their own unlock code and. Gigarama, my software. So, wow. but uh, it, it, I used Gigarama, the Gigarama book, because the first half of the book was it, it was almost it was kind of like an addendum to my first business book, Building Managing Music Career. So the first half was uh, ex- ex- talking about business, then the second half was uh, Gigarama software, okay. the instruction manual, the instructions how to use it, why to use it, in, in in conjunction with the CD. So that did real well. So that really fortified me. And uh, as time as time progressed, as we got into the 2000s, uh, you know, here I am doing my, my jazz thing, uh, independent jazz thing. And uh, then I, um, my daughter was always writing books. I'll have to say that. She, uh, she lives in Houston. She was a nurse practitioner, but she writes all these certification books. She has over 30 books right now. Okay, wow. But there was a time when she had asked me, her dad, to help her with her covers. Okay. So... So she enlisted me to help her with her covers, and boy, did she keep me busy. I mean, every few weeks, there's another cover to do. I said, oh, my God, she's doing all these covers. But uh, And it kind of gave me that because she was self-publishing her books. Okay. And that was my first time thinking about maybe I should try to self-publish something, self-publish something in this realm. Now, I did my, my first two endeavors back in the 80s were, in fact, self-published, you know, but that wasn't a popular term the way it is. Now. Today, okay. you know, we have a whole different platform for the self-publishing aspect of books. So that really kind of clued me into to take a, a chance or, or, or take a venture on self-publishing. So since it had been so many years ago with my music business book, Building Managing Music Career, that has since gone out of print and that publishing entity has come to demise. I said, I, I've always wanted to revisit that. I want to redo a version of that. And since I had my, my copyright rescinded back to me, so I took it upon myself to uh, redo that book and write some new things, you know, to correlate with what's happening today. And I came out with Building Your Music Career. Uh, and that was my first version of a uh, self-published book. And I actually broke it up into three parts. Okay. And uh, so I did that. And that's what got me on that rim. The next thing I know, uh, like I said, my daughter had been doing her covers. Other people had started, been, had started coming up to me and asking me, can you help me with this? And I didn't have an idea of a business model for it. I said, man, this is something I do. I don't, it's, it's, it changes when you're now, you're exchanging money for a service and because I always kept it within myself. I, but, so, but lo and behold, people just kept coming. I said, okay, I'm going to have to do something with this. So I began to think, look at business models and construct my own business model. And, and here we are today. Here we are today. Yes. Self-publish me. Self-publish me, yes. So how did you come up with that, the name of that? <laughs> Woo, self-publish me. I, I'm, I'm a person, now, I, I feel blessed that yeah. I'm a graphic. Because you're, you're more, you're, you really assist people, you know, with, with the publishing aspect. I mean, you yes. you're, you have to be very patient. I, I, I can say that. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> well. Definitely. You were patient with me. And so... 
So how did you come up with that self-published me? Because, you know, you know I, I say that you're, you know, a consultant for, mm -hmm. for publishing, um, for the person who wants to publish their book. Yes. Well, um, one thing, it took me a long time to realize, because I always, I've always talked to people. I've always been those uh, kind of a motivator, so to speak. And people would always talk to me. And as a matter of fact, I just um, made me think of another book, one of my, a recent book I wrote about two years ago called uh, The Power of Trying, Finding Your Success. And it's about motivation and acting upon ideas and believing that your, um, your ideas are worthy of, of, or expounding upon or pursuing. So that's what that was about. But I always found myself talking to people because they'd gravitate to me and ask me questions, and I'm either consoling them or, or giving, another, giving them another perspective on a, a business idea or some type of creative idea. And, it, and lo and behold, they, they've, I've, they've find themselves fortified after speaking with me. And it seems like uh, something I've always freely done. So that's applicable to many things, to the arts, to just general endeavors in life. And now if we apply that same aspect to books, consulting, con call it what you will, but yes. So when I work with a client, I'm not only designing their book, but I am consult consulting them because I have such a passion for it and I want to see them su succeed. It needs to be a mutual success on both sides, a success for, imp for them and a success for us as well. So, um, I, so I try to um, implement that in the form of, of a con consult consulting or offering my whether it's advice or support or what have you. And to me, uh, self-publish me, self-publish is, you know, a common phrase in the industry, self-publish. And, and as I think of not only a business name, I think of the URL that will go with it because I will, you know, start making a, you know, working on a website and stuff like that. And I say, okay, it's got to be something simple. It's got to be an under easily understand, understood phrase. It's not self-publish you. In a way, it is self-publish you, but self-publish me because they're coming to me asking them asking me us to self-publish them so yes. and making it personal self-publish me yes so we came up with that and fortunately that was available to get, get as, as a url so we i grabbed that url and i just ran with the concept of self-publish me well i'm glad you grabbed it and i'm glad that i came across it <laughs> i'm glad you and... did too <laughs> maurice where is your book available and how can people you know contact you to to get it wonderful thank you for asking uh, Dragonfly Summer is a dream before tomorrow. You can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and you can get, to, get it through my personal website, mauricejohnson.org, mauricejohnson.org. And I'd like to say it's also available in, in uh, ebook, soft cover, uh, hardback, and hardback with a dust jacket. That's available on, on Barnes & Noble. But thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. And, again, this is Maurice Johnson author of Dragonfly Summers. A Dream Before Tomorrow. A Dream Before Tomorrow. Check it out. Thank you for listening and joining me on the porch. Remember to take time to reflect, share memories, and engage with others on your porch. And I'll meet you here next time on The Porch, your podcast for community conversations. Brought to you by the Possibilities Podcast Platform.